This is IAQ Radio, indoor air quality radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z Man, Cliff Zlotten. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. We've got a great show for you today. We've got Dr. Gene Cole joining us. Uh, we're going to talk about water damage, sewage, mold, and public health. Called it a research to practice because Dr. Cole has been very closely involved with the practitioner community as well as being a researcher at Brigham Young University over the years and looking forward to a great show. Check out our Facebook and YouTube pages. Leave a comment, like, or subscribe. You can also sign up for the weekly show announcement at iaqradio.com. And, of course, you can get our podcast through Podbean or iTunes. We also have continuing education credits available. Send me an email at joe.hughes at iaqtraining.com. We'll get you out the quiz. Before we start, we also want to announce and thank our newest association sponsor, Siri, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute. See more deeply through science and research. Learn more at SiriScience.org. And now let's thank our platinum sponsor. IAQ Radio platinum sponsor is John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. I also want to thank our gold sponsors, Particles Plus, Healthy Indoors Magazine, Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, and AEML Inc. Laboratory. And of course, our association sponsors, the Indoor Air Quality Association and the Restoration Industry Association. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com, or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio trivia question. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go up to Canada. Dawn Weeks in Air Environmental in Ottawa, Ontario, was first to identify Tricom 21st Century Press as the publisher of Dr. Michael Berry's book, Protecting the Built Environment, Cleaning for Health. The IQ radio trivia question for today, Friday, April 12, 2019, has been sponsored by ID is the solution chemistry company providing unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Here's today's trivia question. Name the heterogeneous group of gram-positive, generally anaerobic bacteria noted for a filamentous and branching growth pattern that results in most forms in an extensive colony or mycelium. Back to you, Joe. Okay, today's guest is Dr. Gene Cole. He's the Director of Research for LRC Indoor Testing and Research in Cary, North Carolina, probably better known as the former Professor of Environmental Health Sciences at Brigham Young University. He has 35 years of research experience with a primary focus on the ecology of indoor and work environments with a special emphasis on identification and reduction of pollutant reservoirs and sources, bioaerosols, human exposure assessment and control, product evaluation, cleaning and restoration, mold and sewage remediation and biocides right up our alley. Dr. Cole is also a member of the Scientific Advisory Council of the Cleaning Industry Research Institute and a fellow of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. Good, uh, good, good morning, Dr. Cole. Do we have you on the line? Thanks, Joe. Good to be with you today. Welcome. Great to have you, and I uh, look forward to a, a nice talk. I, I. You know, we've been wanting to get you on for years, and um, I just saw an article recently in the cleaning industries, uh, the Siri uh, Quarterly, and uh, got my attention, and I thought, you know, I've definitely got to find a way to get you on here. So you, you've had a really long and distinguished career in academia, but have also, you know, stayed on the, the front lines of public health, which is, I think, something we try to do for our show, bring research to practice. 
let's start with how did you become so interested in and focused on the ecology of indoor and work environments? Well, I guess it goes back before I got specific uh, education and training in graduate school. Uh, prior to that, for some 10 years, I was a clinical microbiologist, so I worked in medical centers working with physicians to isolate and identify infectious disease agents and um, quickly gained a lot of knowledge and information relative to uh, not only what were these infectious agents causing, in some cases, uh, devastating diseases, but how did those occur? What were the exposure scenarios uh, involved? What were the risks? And so without knowing it at the time, that began to formulate my interest in what later would become public health. And so with that background, uh, starting my graduate programs uh, over a six-year period at the University of North Carolina School of Public Health um, back in the late 70s, early 80s, um, I began to not only learn and investigate and conduct research relative to the indoor environment, uh, but to have some choice experiences. Now, back in the late 70s and through the 80s, one of the drivers for indoor environmental issues was the outbreak of Legionnaire's disease in 1976, Bellevue Stratford Hotel in Philadelphia. I believe that's still there to this day. Um, and of course, it was the ventilation system contaminated by the bacteria. Uh, Legionella pneumophila resulted in uh, some 200 illnesses. Uh, I think it was 129 individuals that uh, actually died. Uh, they were very susceptible and um, over the next uh, several years, I wound up actually doing a number of investigations, most of which when it was uh, pared down to a very good likelihood of Legionnaire's disease, uh, which is a very potent um, respiratory illness, uh, produces a fulminant pneumonia, so forth. Um, it was fairly easy to detail how the outbreaks uh, could have occurred, which mainly were buildings with um, air handling systems that utilized cooling towers that were contaminated from the bacteria, which came from the soil as dust was blown into uh, those systems. And I guess more specifically in terms of other indoor environmental quality experiences that I had, I'll share briefly, was uh, my first home investigation. And again, this I was a member of a team still as a graduate student and uh, still learning, but this was a residential environment. So this was a home in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where a professor at the university uh, had become so debilitated uh, that he couldn't work for a long period of time. Um, extreme fatigue, uh, muscle aches, respiratory problems. And um, if I recall, he was out of work for maybe two years and then did feel better with various treatments of one type or another. It seen several physicians and was attempting to get back to work uh, it wasn't to the point where he could go and work full-time at the university. He spent most of his time working from home, uh, research-related things, documents, papers, uh, that sort of thing. So um, he still experienced problems. And um, he, in talking to some of his colleagues, including those of the School of Public Health and Environmental Science felt that um, whatever the cause of his initial illness was, and it still might be related, he was reacting to his home environment. 
And so if you can't go to your workplace to work and now you're reacting to your home, uh, it becomes a major issue. And so he relayed it. I remember speaking with him um, in terms of his, I would call it sensitivity. Well, hypersensitivity in reality. Um, he said one of his daughters uh, came home one day and within minutes he started reacting hmm. and uh, finally talked with her and so forth. And, uh, you know, was there anything recently that was new uh, in her life or uh, what was going on? What was she using? Turned out she had uh, used a new hairspray. And he reacted violently to that. And then another time, he started having these sensitivity reactions, and he searched the entire house. Turned out to be a moldy cucumber in the refrigerator. Hmm. And so that was my first experience with extreme hypersensitivity. And at that time, he had some progressive... Um, lung disorder, and it was potentially life-threatening. So he wanted an entire assessment of the home. And so we went everywhere doing moisture mapping, uh, crawl space investigation, up in the attic, um, outside, duct work, uh, everything. Probably the major thing we finally zeroed in on was one bathroom in the home where uh, apparently when the home had been built 12 years before, uh, the plumber had never soldered the connection hmm. with the shower head on the outside of the wall to the water pipe on the inside. And so for 12 years, water had sprayed uh, every time someone took a shower into that wall cavity. And of oh. course that was opened up and, you know, it was black with mold and bacteria and, uh, and so forth. So there were other areas that were identified that needed to be cleaned, uh, and his home environment wasn't being cleaned. I remember uh, it looked like a black dust on the window sills in some of the rooms, and um, so we recommended cleaning, thorough remediation of all the water damaged areas, and so forth. And um, there were so many problems. I remember telling him. You know, you need to realize that the only solution to your problem might be moving, getting out of this house. And he wasn't agreeable to doing that as uh, he'd already spent, I forget how many thousands, tens of thousands of dollars uh, trying to determine what the problems were, fix them and so forth. But Obviously, there was a lot more to be done, and um, we kind of left him in a quandary with that. But from that point on, with those experiences, um, it became an area of scientific interest. At that time, things were uh, just beginning to be known about the indoor environment. Uh, of course, I remember when I was in graduate school, the report came down from the National Cancer Institute that formaldehyde was a confirmed animal carcinogen and of course that made it a suspect human carcinogen and um, asbestos uh, same thing mm -hmm. and asbestos then was banned from the building industry and so forth and I remember one day discussing things um, at the school with some of my student colleagues and we were talking about uh, you know, how millions of people still had asbestos guns in their homes, which were hair dryers. At that hmm. time, they were insulated with asbestos. So those years, the late 70s and on into the 80s, were areas where things began to emerge in terms of the indoor environment and human health. Over your, you've had a long career, I'm wondering, uh, and a lot of it was focused on, you know, the, the ecology of indoor environments, water damage, uh, mold remediation, flooding, sewage. What would you consider to be your most important contribution 
to the state of the art in those areas? Oh my. Um, I, I guess in terms of my contribution, and of course, we all learn as we go along. Um, I still enjoy going to meetings and conferences where individuals who have recognized expertise and specialties and so forth share their experiences. We all learn from one another. But mainly what I've done over the past close to 40 years now, uh, being a scientist and a researcher, is to glean from the science and determine what does that mean for the average person, the general population. And so I've spent uh, a lot of, most of that time over those years taking the science and translating it into information that the public can use. In other words, here are things you can do to make your home healthier. And we may be talking about carpet and carpet cleaning. We may be talking about um, building products. We might be talking about air handling systems. Uh, and of course, I've done this in other areas of public health. It's very similar to, okay, what can all of us do to reduce our risk for various types of cancer? Well, we're into nutrition. We're into, you know, not smoking. We're into uh, using sunscreen, so forth. So it's the same approach with the indoor environment. Uh, let's glean from the science and determine what can we put forth to the general population. And then, of course, it's up to individuals to either attempt to adopt those things uh, or not. And the greatest challenge in public health, especially when you have a strong association or in some cases cause and effect relationship between a hazard and uh, an illness or a disease or a syndrome is behavior change. You know, we're all stubborn. People want to do things their own way based on their own experiences and what they feel they want to do um, and not have someone tell them what to do. Uh, and that's, that becomes a challenge. And so I guess that's my greatest contribution is attempting to um, educate, uh, based on my experience, anyone who might benefit from it. Hence, for example, the uh, paper in the Siri uh, Cleaning Science Quarterly on sewage. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Cliff, before we do, did you want to jump in here? My, my, my first question, Gene, really uh, goes to drawing buildings. And I think when restoration professionals got into drying buildings, you know, we would measure relative humidity. And I don't think we understood um, specific humidity. We didn't understand dew point. We didn't understand the water activity. And I think, uh, you know, thanks to you and, uh, you know, some of your colleagues, I think we have a better understanding uh, of that. And what my question is, is, is when is a building dry? And is it dry once we reduce the water activity of uh, drywall and other surfaces uh, to the point where it will not support growth? Or do we have to keep on drying the building for some lengthy time and doing moisture mapping and so on and so forth? Is that really necessary? So that's my question. Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Cliff. And I guess my answer, which I don't mean to be too general, but uh, the point at which drying is complete depends upon what dry is for that environment in that area uh, of the country. You know, I, I in the can't United hear States. Can you? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. We have. Um, we have eight different climatic regions uh, in the U.S. And uh, myself, for example, living in the southeastern U.S., uh, this is a semi-tropical climate, um, very high humidity. Uh, we're on the ocean. Um, you know, we're doing good if we can get indoor relative humidity in the summertime uh, down to the mid-50s. 50% RH, 
where it's going to be different if you're in Arizona or New Mexico or northern Texas, that type of thing. So I guess my short answer is what are the norms for moisture content, acceptable moisture content in wood, drywall, um, you know, laminates, all of the other building materials and finishing materials um, in that particular indoor environment. Um, and that does require measurement and expertise for that particular area of the country. Fair enough, and I appreciate the answer, and I think I agree with you. I'm curious, as far as identifying damp indoor environments, pollution reservoirs, uh, sources of indoor environments, you know, we hear a lot today about the microbiome, and, and we're able to do DNA analysis for different organisms, um, you know, thousands of them now. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the progress we've made. Uh, sometimes I feel like we can't see the forest because of the trees. You know, it's like we have, we're seeing all this new information, but um, fundamentally, what's the way to measure and determine whether we have damp indoor environments or, or excessive microbiological organisms in indoor environments? Yeah, that's uh, a simple question with probably uh, a lot of complicating answers. Um, you know, we can uh, do sampling of surfaces and air, but that's time consuming and expensive and doesn't necessarily give us the information uh, that we need. Um, the initial questions, of course, we need to ask are the occupants uh, comfortable? Uh, do they have humidity uh, under control? Um, have there been recent instances or situations of, of water damage? Um, there was a study I did years ago, probably uh, 15, 16 years ago, when I was first at BYU, and I had a group of students working with me, graduate students, and uh, we decided to investigate single-family homes in a certain community there in Utah and um, thoroughly investigate 25 of them relevant to factors that could relate to moisture, uh, accumulation, uh, past history of uh, perhaps flooding or moisture intrusion, um, issues with mold, sewage, uh, that type of thing. So the first thing was um, these were homeowners, not renters. Um, they had to have been in the home for at least 10 years. They um, therefore knew the history. And so we went in with a team and we did an extensive history. Have you ever had a sewage backup? Um, have you ever had flooding? Do you know if you've had a mold problem? Um, do you have anyone in the home that's been living here that has respiratory allergies, asthma? Have they had problems, so forth? And then we did a room-by-room -room assessment of moisture, we moisture mapped the entire home on the inside. We investigated um, attics, uh, evidence of roof leaks, uh, basements. Uh, in Utah, there are a lot of basements, not crawl spaces. Um, found some homes that had uh, sewage problems. They had uh, leaking sewage. Others had been flooded majorly or minorly. Um, and then we did an assessment of the outside, you know, was the home at the bottom of a grade where rainwater would run towards the house? Did it drain away? Uh, what was the drainage like? Did the builder put in sufficient roof drains? You know, were there gutters and downspouts and where did they go? 
Did they just channel the water straight to the foundation, which in many homes, that's exactly what it did. Um, I remember one home that had a concrete driveway that at the end of it became uh, a concrete pad at the back of the home for you know, recreation and barbecuing and so forth. And we noticed that it sloped towards the corner of the house. There were cracks in the concrete. And so I said, let's go inside and see what's going on in that corner of the home. Well, we just uh, mapped out the moisture and, of course, on the carpet, from the corner of the home, eight feet out, it was all damp. The owner said, I had no clue that that was a problem. Well, obviously, that had been occurring every time they had a heavy rain. Water would pool up, had nowhere to drain, and it would seep through the exterior wall into the interior wall cavity, and then from then on, uh, depending upon the amount of water. So um, trying to focus on the original question, what, what do we uh, focus on? Is that what you're referring to? What are the indicators? Is yeah, I mean, problem? what are the problems? You know, we get a lot of research, like I said, on the microbiome and other things. Is it just stick to the basics? You know, does it smell moody? Is it does it look damp? Do we have uh, problems like you just described? And if so, we've got to fix those. Um, do we focus too much on measurements sometimes? I I think we do, and I think what I've just outlined are some um, some of the issues that we need to focus on and at the same time, you know, educate those who are living in the home or the office building, whatever the work environment might be. In fact, I remember now one of those homes uh, in Utah, there was a uh, 12 year old that had an aquarium. And of course, uh, that's a humidification system mm -hmm. and the uh, water was bubbling and there was no cover on the top. It was so humid in there that the window sills and window frames, which were wood, were all growing mold. I mean, it was just a fungal farm. And uh, no one paid much attention to it. There was also an upstairs bathroom that was severely water damaged and mold coming out of cracks and crevices where moisture had penetrated the wall, the tile, uh, and that type of thing. So practical things. Again, there was another home where I'm sitting in the living room looking out this big picture window and I go over and I start looking at the window frame and uh, I see stains obviously from water around the uh, frame of the window and um, I said, has there been a moisture problem here that you're aware of? The owner said, no. And I said, okay, I looked out. They had this big front lawn, and I said, do you have an automatic sprinkling system? He said, yeah, it comes on, you know, all the time. I said, does it hit the front of the house? And she said, oh, yeah, it, you know, hits the brick on the outside and so forth. And so that turned out to be the source of the moisture. Uh, you know, water under pressure against a brick facade, very porous. Um, allowed moisture to penetrate all the way into, through the wall cavity to the drywall on the inside, uh, beginning to rot the window frame and, and so forth. So uh, we still have to go by you know, our eyes and other senses. You're absolutely right. And in fact, I'm doing a, a webinar again for the EPA uh, next week and it's on um, water damaged homes, what can homeowners do themselves in terms of remediation and restoration. So it's focusing on cleaning, drying, the use of disinfectants, uh, and so forth. And I bring up those three questions, you know, uh, how do you know when it's done and do they need to do testing for mold or bacteria and so forth? And, um, I pose the three questions. You know, does it look clean? Uh, does it feel dry? Is there an odor? And so if those three things are in compliance, then again, it's up to the homeowner 
they may at that point wish to just begin the rebuild or mm. they have yeah. sensitive individuals in the home. They may want indoor environmental professional to come in and do clearance testing. But again, that's additional cost. And the focus recently in the last few years by the EPA in terms of indoor environmental quality has been, okay, we know that in water damage, flood damage situations, a lot of people are going to be doing their own work because they have no insurance, they have no money for a restoration company, they're going to do it themselves. Let's give them some guidance so they can do it right, do it safely. Um, so hope that helps. Absolutely. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, we're at halftime, but before we go to halftime, I just want to mention something quickly and see if, if um, what your thoughts are while we're talking about measurement um, before, during, and after remediation. You, um, you were part of a study um, on ATP as a marker for surface contamination of biological origin in schools and a potential approach to the measurement of cleaning effectiveness. Could ATP be one of the ways where we could have a uh, quick, somewhat inexpensive, um, you know, less, uh, less need for, you know, sending out for analysis to assist with determining when we're done with cleaning after a water damage or a mold remediation? Uh, that's a great question, Joe. Right now, we're still struggling with how well can we adopt ATP in terms of standardizing its use to evaluate the effectiveness of cleaning in non-water damaged environments. Mm. In fact, that published study was done in the southwestern U.S., 27 school buildings, thousands of ATP samples, um, and of course there can be quite a bit of variability uh, and beginning to focus towards water damage restoration with ATP. Um, I would say that we already know, and there are papers on this that have been published as well, there's really no correlation between ATP values and actual microbial counts, bacterial counts in particular. So you have that variability. ATP is a different measurement than directly measuring uh, viable bacteria. Uh, in a water-damaged environment for clearance testing, uh, I don't see its use at the present time uh, without perhaps some additional research in defining an acceptable approach. And what I mean by that is even in, and I'm coordinating a study right now in North Carolina in a school district. And again, we're looking to reduce rates of disease transmission and reduce absenteeism uh, in these elementary schools, you know, due to colds and flu, diarrhea and so forth. And we have intervention schools being cleaned with a set protocol and others that uh, are just controls and basically an absence of cleaning. We're doing high contact surfaces with the desktops. And um, we're hoping that we can standardize a protocol for cleaning and confirm it with ATP measures. We see differences between, in terms of water damage, what is your baseline? You need a baseline of some sort. And then there are other complicating factors with ATP. ATP, uh, testing, of course, is to detect ATP, which is the energy source of all living cells. So whether it's cells that have flaked off or it's viable or dead bacteria, um, you know, what, what is your baseline for acceptable uh, remediation, restoration of a previously flood damaged uh, indoor environment? Uh, it would take research on those materials 
in those situations, um, again, what would be an acceptable baseline relative to the different climatic regions of the country? It's the same with healthcare environments. And um, because of the work that was done on that theory, ISA, ISSA study that was published, um, we're well on our way to establishing a more specific approach to the use of ATP to be used in the cleaning of schools. Well, can we use those data for hospitals? Well, not really. Those are different environments, different ecosystems. If we want a standard ATP, we would need to collect our data in hospitals. So for water damage restoration using ATP, we would have to focus our efforts on the various structural building finishing materials in different areas of the country uh, in order to establish an acceptable baseline that could then be used to interpret ATP afterwards. So Long-winded answer. Hopefully uh, that helps. Yeah. I think it does help. I mean, it's just, you know, we're not there yet, and that's that's fine. That's, you know, that, that happens a lot. Um, but I think what we'll do is let's take our little break here. We're going to thank our sponsors. We'll be back in 90 seconds with Dr. Gene Cole. We're going to talk a little bit more about the article he had in the Siri Science Quarterly and uh, talk a little bit more about water damage restoration and flooding and sewage. IAQ Radio Platinum Sponsor is John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Gold sponsors are Particles Plus Engineers and Manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at Healthy Indoors. Com and AEML Laboratories. Free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, who use advanced sensor software technology and embedded computers to provide superior environmental test instrumentation. Visit them at WolfSense.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at IAQA.org and RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. And our newest association sponsor is Siri, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute. See more deeply through science and research. Learn more at SiriScience.org. We're back with Dr. Gene Cole, and, and we're going to go right into this article you wrote in the Cleaning Science Quarterly, The Science of Sewage Risks for Public and Worker Health in the New Millennium. I guess... Um, we're going to be running a little low on time. I want to get to the roundup and bring in the restoration industry global watchdog when we do. But uh, before we do, let's talk a little bit about this article. Um, what is kind of new with respect to the science of sewage? I mean, you've been looking at this for many, many years. How has it changed recently, Gene? Well, the composition of sewage and what's in it and what we now know to be more hazardous than before uh, is quite extensive. Um, some of you might remember two or three decades ago that commercial on television, you know, this is not your father's Oldsmobile. Well, this is not your father's sewage. Uh, it's quite a bit different. It's not just human waste anymore. It's a much extended long list of industrial chemicals and then human hygiene and medication chemical compounds uh, makes it 
makes it quite different. The microbes that are in sewage now, a um, number of published studies, and in the paper I have an extensive uh, bibliography to that extent, uh, showing extreme antibiotic resistance. And it's not surprising. Uh, we are in the age now of extreme antibiotic resistance, in some cases with specific diseases. Um, physicians are down to maybe one antibiotic that may or may not work uh, to stem the tide of an infectious disease process. Um, in some cases, we have strains of organisms like Staph aureus, for example. Uh, fortunately, it hasn't spread over the last few years to become commonplace, but resistant to every one of the known classes of antibiotics. Uh, we have a problem with disease-resistant TB. TB is resurging across the earth. Um, the human element contributing to this is varied. Um, on average, we probably all take an antibiotic once or twice a year. Um, we excrete the products of that antibiotic, broken down or not broken down, uh, goes into the sewage system. Um, other medications, we have individuals on, you know, neuropsychiatric medications, uh, individuals on toxic anti-chemotherapy, anti-cancer drugs, chemotherapeutic agents. Uh, we have tens of millions of women on birth control pills, and of course they're excreting estrogens into the environment. We can see the effects ecologically in the natural environment. Uh, you can just look at the Potomac River, for example, where male fish are showing female characteristics, uh, male fish with ovaries. Uh, that's not normal. And so uh, that's a major concern, especially when uh, the Potomac River serves as the major source of drinking water for some 5 million people in the Baltimore, D.C. area. And the majority of those chemical compounds uh, derived from pharmaceuticals, from hormones, uh, from antibiotics and the like, um, are not removed at the wastewater treatment facility. Wastewater becomes our drinking water. And um, that is a major concern at this point in time. And then we're concerned getting back to the restoration industry in particular, uh, ensuring that those that remediate um, sewage losses are adequately protected, that they're in good health, that they have the required equipment checks, that they're up to date on the essential immunizations that they should have, they should be qualified by a physician. Um, so uh, this is what we're looking at. And as I put in the article, uh, the variety of bacteria has expanded over the years. Uh, emerging pathogens, what, 20 years ago, we didn't have oxygenic E. coli, and yet it's caused death in tens of thousands of individuals um, as sewage has been sprayed on crops, for example, and mm. there have been outbreaks, uh, and they're more antibiotic resistant. We have uh, parasites, and then we have uh, industrial chemicals. This is another aspect. Consumers purchase an arsenal of cleaning products. They do serve um, good purposes, but those products, though full strength or diluted but unbroken down into the sewage system, and they have effects on the external environment, and if they affect the external environment, we have to take the other leap. Well, if they're going to be in the drinking water, and what effects will they have on humans? You know, one thing, this is kind of a, uh, aside, but while we've had this increase in hazardous composition of the sewage over the years, we've also experienced 
what appears to be an increase in human infertility. More and more uh, individuals, couples, are seeking fertility assistance uh, to have children. Does this have anything to do with the environment, with these chemical residuals in our drinking water, uh, and the like? And the answer is possibly. So if we look at uh, the increase in breast cancer, infertility, um, and some other illnesses that are chronic, what are the implications of environmental influence? And I go right away to sewage and drinking water as potential possibilities. You know, we talk, you, you talked a bit about the people doing the restoration work. I'd like to ask one more question, then go into the roundup. And, and Cliff, jump in here if you have something you wanted to add. I do. Okay. Um, I'll make it quick. Are there any studies that actually show what types of issues, health issues, restoration workers have actually come down with while doing restoration work? I mean, it seems to me there's, there's not much there and that we're, we're basing the recommendations on, for instance, sewage uh, plant workers or, or other, you know, worst case scenarios. Well, you, you're right. Uh, there really isn't research out there. Um, there have been papers here and there over the years, as you just mentioned, looking at sewage treatment plant workers, measuring exposures to endotoxins in particular, which can result in respiratory problems and some systemic problems. Endotoxin can potentiate um, severe respiratory illness and uh, contribute to other conditions. Uh, I mean, that's, it's, it's been demonstrated in some of those studies. Um, some of the workers, their intestinal flora has been uh, evaluated. And, you know, that is something that, again, we need to think about in terms of worker protection. Um, I think there are two studies out there where they looked at the bacteria in the guts of uh, sewage treatment plant workers that had potential exposures um, to sewage and essentially their gut floor was very similar to what was in the sewage. Uh, not that they had, you know, all the potential pathogens, E. coli, salmonella and the like, but um, different than the quote normal population of workers. Um, but you're right, there's uh, not been research on restoration workers who do, let's say, you know, sewage remediation on a regular basis or all the time. Part of that is to do research, you need funding. And to get funding, there has to be, in general, if we look at NIOSH, you know, the government agency for doing research in the area of occupational health and safety, and that is there needs to be uh, some evidence, case studies, and a number of them that say, hey, you know, there's a bunch of workers in this industry that this is what they do on the job, and they all seem to have a variety of illnesses or common illness. Um, you know, this needs to be researched. Well, then NIOSH's ears perk up, and they may appropriate funds to investigate that. But if there's not any indication that this is, you know, a problem across the country that, let's say, several thousand workers each year are experiencing, then the research just won't get done. So I think right now with the um, voluntary consensus standards that are out there on water damage restorations, um, EPA guidance documents, uh, training materials, for example, I just finished updating my chapter on chemicals, which is mainly uh, antimicrobials, biocides, uh, to the RIA training, training manual, um, then uh, you know, I think that's, that's the best we have at this time. So until we see essentially an outbreak, an epidemic, um, I don't see the research happening, and I think we're addressing it sufficiently. 
at this time. Okay. Cliff, did you want to jump in and get a question before we go uh, to wrap? I, I, I do. Uh, first, um, Gene, uh, in my uh, questions that I submitted to you, I'm not sure whether or not you are familiar with this uh, Pittsburgh protocol. I'm not going to ask you a question about it. I'm just going to suggest perhaps if you're unfamiliar with it, that you look at it before you um, do your EPA presentation, because you may get some uh, different ideas or perspectives from a remediation standpoint. But uh, my final question is, you know, retrospectively, if we look back on, you know, the stacky botrys driven mold to gold rush, uh, do you think that as a whole, all parties overreacted to it? Um, I guess my general answer would be yes. Um, for the public, it became, you know, something akin to the Black Death, you know, the plague, <laughs> and uh, literally, <laughs> uh, you know, that uh, any mold that looked dark was toxigenic and they were going to die. Uh, at the same time, as we know, it spurred the water damage restoration industry to respond to emphasizing that good research and science uh, needed to be done to explain what was happening. Uh, and back in the early stages, yes, there were many individuals who thought, you know, mold is gold. And they, you know, last week they were, uh, you know, plastering walls, and this week there's a sign on the pickup truck that says mold remediation. Right. And to put it in perspective, I got a phone call years ago, so 12, 15 years ago, something like that, woman in California, and uh, had to be California, right? Sorry right. if any of you listening are from California, but <laughs> there's some strange dudes out there, let's face it. Never. Uh, and this woman said, I got your name and uh, just wanted to fly something by you. She said, I've had water damage uh, in the two back bedrooms of my home here in California. And I know there's mold growing. I mean, I can see it visibly. Uh, and I'm assuming it's also in the walls. You know, I've done some reading about it. I know it has to be taken care of. And so I started looking, who could I call? And I found this one um, individual that said he was a mold remediator. And so I asked him to come and take a look, give me an estimate. And so she said what he proposed was that he would go into these bedrooms and he would open up the wall cavities. And he would also open up the windows and then he would set up huge fans and to blow the air from the rooms out the windows and that he would take a, a blow driver, a dryer, a uh, you know leaf blower right. and blow all the mold out of the wall cavities mm -hmm. and then blow them out the window. <laughs> and she said, that just, doesn't seem right to me. <laughs> I said, oh my gosh. I said, no, it's not right. That's the absolute worst thing that anyone could ever do to your mold situation. And I hope you haven't agreed to do it or paid any money. And she said, no. I said, okay. I said, nope, that's a scam artist. He has no training, no expertise in what needs to be done and explain to her how to contact a reputable company that had the experience, the equipment, and would not blow, you know, X billion mold spores all over her home and cause more of a problem. So, uh, yeah, on all sides of the issue early on. Uh, but I'm impressed with uh, the restoration industry uh, that I started interacting with in 1990. So that's almost 30 years, right. 29 years uh, this year. And at the time, 
you know, I knew nothing about it and uh, have been working and um, giving up my time as necessary to, to help improve things. And I think we're in a great place today in that regard. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's, let's go to the roundup, John. All right. We've got to start with the restoration industry, global watchdog, Pete Consigli. Pete, I know you've been chomping at the bit there. Ask a question, make a comment, whatever you'd yeah. like. Uh, let me just jump right in. I uh, actually I took some notes in the beginning because I had some comments I wanted to make. Anyway, I, I enjoyed your conversation with Gene. And Gene, just to correct the record straight, you first started getting involved with the industry in the late 80s. It was probably circa 88, 89 when uh, Cooper uh, recruited you and, um, and Dr. Berry when you were both working at the EPA. But you, you did really your best work in the 90s, fa- fabulous work before you moved on to uh, – uh, to BYU. Um, I, uh, so listen, um, one of the things that I want to throw out here, and I, I actually was talking to John Downey last week after the uh, interview with Jim Harris, and it's my feeling that uh, the series should consider next year, I guess in 2020, to do a Cleaning for Health Symposium. Now, um, a lot of people may think that Cleaning for Health term has kind of been uh, – diluted and it's overused, uh, no different than the whole green cleaning, green term. But, but I believe there should be a theme about cleaning for health put into perspective for the 21st century. And, um, you know, I'm really happy to see the committee that uh, John's put together, the SAC committee for uh, Siri with, uh, with Shaughnessy and Moon and Dr. Spivak and yourself, Gene. Uh, seems like uh, all, all he's put a big fence up to prevent you guys from just wandering out into the pasture, you know, in this in your twilight years, which I think is really, really a good thing. And so, uh, so Gene, I, I, I'm, I'm formally throwing out there for the record, and Cliff's taking notes to put it in his blog, that you should share that. And the way that I make my case for that is, if you recall, Gene, we did two fabulous Cleaning for Health symposiums uh, in the mid, in the late 1990s, the last one being in 1999 in Seattle, uh, under Merck with Sue Smith. Actually, I see Sue Valenti's on the call. She probably remember the, remember those days. And that that cleaning, those cleaning for health symposiums were fabulous. And the guys that you had that did the research on the vacuums and from uh, Hoover and all that kind of stuff was something. And and Jim Harris mentioned some of that. Uh, you know, that research on an interview last week, and I, I just think that there's a, a whole audience there that, that needs to see that and to be updated. In particular, the thing that has stuck with me two decades later, it, you had a colleague of yours, a public health guy, uh, like your counterpart from Denmark that was a keynote speaker. His name was Dr. Peter. His last name began with a V. I don't remember it, but I'm sure you do. And he made a statement, you could hear a pin drop in the audience, when he talked about the difference between the EU and the U.S. when it comes to maintaining buildings in this whole cleaning for health. And in essence, the cliff note version is that in Europe, the caretakers of the buildings are held in high regard because the buildings are where people spend a lot of their time, and it's a profession. Where in the U.S., the first thing to get cut, it's a part-time job, are the, are, are the janitorial people and the housekeepers. And his statement was, until the U.S. changes that mindset and that philosophy, we will always have those problems because we don't take it, you know, the same way the European philosophy. I think that's something that's worth, you know, advocating 20 years later and seeing if we can change the hearts and minds. It's really changing in people's hearts that will change their, that will change their minds. Um, so I, that's something that I, I for sure would throw out there. I think there's a lot of research older research that could be brought back up. One of the things, you know, I saw Joe has started the planning for the Healthy Building Summit in Seven Springs in October. A couple of years ago, I had the chance to do a special presentation with a lot of the old research. And Gene, there was, a, there was at least three or four studies that you did that I had included in my research. And, and there's a lot of other stuff out there. Some of the stuff that uh, Mac Pierce did for the uh, WLS program with mold and a number of other things that, that probably get fallen between the cracks that still have relevance today. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, that's important that these kind of things kind of brought back because sometimes, you know, everything that's old is new again. And uh, um, anyway, so th- those are my thoughts in, in regard to that. 
Um, the summer camp invitations went out, everyone. You got a lot of summer campers on the list yesterday. And I noticed that Lou Harriman made the cut this year. He's doing a two-hour presentation on Wednesday morning that shares the hard lessons learned that call the wet and wild of 40 years of humidity control. I think that's going to be fabulous. I already sent an email out. It's in your inboxes, Joe and Cliff, to all the usual insider suspects on that. Uh, Dave Mason said yesterday, as soon as the invitation hit his inbox, he dropped everything. He called the hotel. He said the line was busy for 20 minutes with the room <laughs> selling out, but he, he finally got he got a, a room in there at a fabulous rate, $125 a night. So you guys are coming to summer camp. We got a couple of newbies, I ain't telling you, but in RAA and other insiders that are going to be coming to really enjoy that. So, uh, so Gene, I, a couple things to wrap up and throw it back to. I'd like your comments on my idea about doing this cleaning for health symposium. Uh, I think the work that you and me did uh, – in the past, not only with Merck, but all the stuff that we did for the, the, when Richard had all, the, all that money from the three regions for Tulsa, uh, I think was groundbreaking stuff. I, I remember it with much fondness and, and really enjoyed our time together doing that. Um, so I would like your thoughts on that. And then the other thing I'd like you to comment on, and this is I'll save this for last, because this may or may not be controversial, and you may or may not, you know, like me and Cliff, would, you know, we would never come up with a controversial thing. I don't know whether you can comment on this, but this whole thing on ATP – when you were at DynCorp, uh, after you left uh, the EPA, um, uh, you were hired, I won't mention the name, but you were hired to, to do uh, uh, private research on the efficacy of ATP in the mid-90s when ATP was just starting to kind of hit the radar here. Uh, and when I was living out in California and doing a lot of work with Jim Holland, a number of the peoples, and David Bierman and Peter Sirk with using ATP after sewage, and that research never got published. Anything that you could share that's not confidential here 20 years later about that I think would be useful because the fact that it wasn't published, you know, tells me, well, maybe the, the, the person that hired you to do that research, maybe the results weren't what they expected or not. So uh, there's a lot of drama and a lot of talk about the use of ATP and uh, I'm kind of on the fence. I can go either way, but I think it has a use, but I don't think it has the, I don't think it's a magic bolt like a lot of people say. So anyway, those are my thoughts today, and um, anyway, I, uh, I look forward, Gene, to seeing you, uh, I guess, at Miami, Ohio in July uh, at the Siri Conference, yes, the SAC meeting. That'll be great, So, uh, and possibly sometime in August, uh, maybe visiting with you in, uh, in the Research Triangle when I pass through the areas, part of the tail end of my summer camp annual road trip. Anyway, uh, enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the interview today, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you guys, boys. Thanks, Pete. Gene, did you want to add anything to what Pete said? Uh, just very quickly, cleaning for health, um, I agree. Of course, the basis for that goes back to Dr. Mike Berry. Uh, what do we mean by cleaning for health? Well, maximizing the physical removal of the unwanted materials while minimizing uh, chemical and moisture residues. And we just now have to... Uh, adapt that to different environments with different materials and designs and so forth and see how we can uh, best make it work. Um, on the ATP, Pete, you just need to send me more information because I just can't recall doing ATP work early on uh, back then in the 90s. Uh, I just remember my ATP work starting years ago when we were investigating the potential for research in the initial phases of the series study. Um, but I will be at the series symposium in Columbus, Ohio uh, in July. And it looks like I will be, uh, I'll just mention this, this will be the last thing. Uh, myself and one of my former students have spent quite a bit of time this past year looking at the issue of cleaning and disinfection in long-term care facilities. Um, you know, I don't want to label long-term care facilities as seething pits of infectious disease, but um, they can be. We're talking about a very susceptible population. We're talking about um, serious pathogens, Clostridium difficile, methicillin resistant staph aureus, uh, vancomycin resistant enterococci, and now we have this newly emerged pathogen, uh, Canada auris, which is 
uh, a yeast, which makes it a fungus, and it's resistant to drug treatment, and it's resistant to environmental decontamination. And so I believe I'm going to be in a uh, presentation slash panel discussion uh, with two other individuals uh, in that one session, and I'm going to be sharing some information about long-term care facility. We'll look forward to that. Uh, Cliff, any final questions? I'm done. Thanks, Joe. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Jane, for joining us. It was yeah, good to hear your voice. I really appreciate it. I wish we could have spent a little more time on the uh, the use of the disinfectants and, and sanitizers. I guess maybe if you could just quickly, I, I, it seems like um, you feel maybe they're overused in regular household cleaning, but you also feel there's a need for them when we're doing certain things like sewage remediation, uh, maybe water damage restoration. Could you comment on that real quick, Gene? Sure. No, I'm uh, in favor of biocides. Um, of course, doing work years ago for the EPA on their uh, standardized methods for evaluating them. Um, you know, most work well. Uh, I wish EPA would require some in-use testing to give us more information, but they do serve a purpose. Uh, things have changed over the years. For example, um, botanicals now are very uh, popular, and um, they demonstrate the efficacy against bacteria, fungi, viruses. Uh, everyone likes them, both users and consumers who are having their homes remediated because it's a, quote, natural element, uh, time oil. And um, definitely for sewage remediation or Category 3 water uh, damage, certainly, which contains a variety of potentially pathogenic agents. Again, we just have to stress uh, safety in their use. Um, as we've been saying now for decades, you know, biocides aren't the solution. They're part of the solution of the problem. And there's a place for them. And uh, we just need to use them properly and, and safely. Uh, and I think things are going well in the industry now in that regard. You know, I'm really glad I asked and that uh, you were willing to stick around and, and uh answer a few questions we went over a little bit with dr gene cole but it was well worth it i want to thank you for joining us also want to thank my co-host the z-man cliff zlotnick uh pete consigli the restoration industry's global watchdog back in the saddle good to have you yeah, back hey uh, joe but yes, before sir. you before you sign off i just wanted to mention to gene gene what i was referring to in the 90 of the atp research you did at DynCorp had to do with one of the manufacturers when the ATP just kind of started hitting the, the radar, if you would, in our industry. And particularly in California, it was a lot of work trying to use that to, as some kind of mechanism to determine the eff efficacy of sewage remediation. And um, But you never published the work. And I, like I said, I'm not really sure why. Maybe uh, the, the, the funder of the study didn't have the results that they wanted. So I didn't know whether there was anything that could be shared in that or not, or whether there was any confidential it confidentiality after two decades but maybe that's something we could talk uh, about uh, at the Siri conference. Yeah, it, I'm, I'm not sure that I did it or finished it or again I can't even remember starting it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, re I remember us talking about it and uh, we'll get a chance okay. to maybe visit in uh, July and, uh, and, uh, and and talk about it a little bit more because it's it's picked up a lot of momentum in the industry and there's a lot of different uses and applications and maybe a little bit controversy about it. I do think it has a place, but sometimes I think it get, kind of gets oversold. So uh, uh, I, anyway, it, it'd be worthy worthy of some. Certainly okay. if you did a cleaning for health thing, I would think that uh, that'd be maybe a good topic to have a good panel on. Anyway, okay guys, thanks a lot, Joe. Thank, thank you. Also, hey, Joe, or, or Joe, if I could just respond to, you know, to Pete's question. I, I think your question was asked and answered, Pete, because Gene talked about it and the difficulties that they were having in trying to uh, utilize it for water damage, trying to use it in schools, trying to use it in, in hospitals. Uh, you need to gather uh, field data you know, from a bunch of, you have to establish the, 
the the data you know wide database in order to do it and you know it seemed to me that that would cost a lot of time and a lot of money and um it would seem to me that uh, no individual manufacturer unless it was a big company like 3m or whatever would be willing to fund something like that but, well that you know what cliff that, that that may be the case so but uh in any case uh uh th th thanks for, thanks for the input on that and Gene, uh, one other thing, that, that great chapter that he wrote on bias eight years ago for the WLS class, almost two decades later, it's still in there, I think, in the uh, revision copy. So uh, good job on that work. Great. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gene Cole, my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Slotnick at the controls. John, you got to have faith. Uh, joining us for the roundup, the Restoration Industries Global Watchdog, Pete. Consigli, most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners will be back next Friday at noon with the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.